Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Disability Rights New Jersey lunchtime webinar entitled Latest Developments in Special Education. Before we start, we just want to give a quick disclaimer that the contents of this webinar are for educational purposes only. Nothing in the contents should be considered legal advice. The purpose of this brief webinar is to touch on some of the important special education issues that have come up recently uh, in the last couple of years you that you should be aware of. Some issues are related to the COVID-19 pandemic, others are not. The primary focuses are stay put and emergent relief. Uh, just a quick few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Disability Rights New Jersey new and improved website. And you can find that at disabilityrightsnj.org. Uh, we do ask that you mute yourself and take yourself off video throughout. And as I said before, we'll be taking questions at the end of the webinar. So you can feel free to be, you can feel free to type them into the chat box. Uh, and hopefully we'll have time at the end to respond to all the questions. Uh, as we go forward. So again, thank you for being here. So our presenter today is Robert A. Robins Robinson. Here is Robert, sorry, I had the wrong slide up. Uh, Mr. Robinson, who is deaf himself, has been a special education attorney with Disability Rights New Jersey since 2002. He has represented clients in special education at just about every level, mediation, due process, in the Office of Administrative Law and in federal court. So before we get to the main part of the webinar, uh, I feel it is important to remind everyone of an important right all students, including those with disabilities have, and that is the right to be free from bullying in the school setting. New Jersey has its own anti-bullying law called the Harassment, Intimidation and Bullying Act HIB for short, the HIB requires each school district to have an anti-bullying coordinator to deal with bullying. You should be able to find your district's anti-bullying coordinator's name on the district's website. If your child is a victim of bullying, you can file a complaint with the anti-bullying coordinator. The coordinator would do an investigation, and when that investigation is done, the coordinator would generate an investigative report containing the findings and whatever actions need to be taken, if any. More information about the HIV, including the investigative process, can be accessed at the link that is on the slide. Uh, the reason why this is being brought up is because, um, sorry, bringing up the HIV is because during the COVID pandemic, um, that has forced many students to receive virtual instruction at home. Uh, so please do not think for one second that a child is, quote, on break, unquote, from any opportunity to be bullied whenever the child is at home. Cyberbullying is a big problem, and HIV does in fact cover cyberbullying also. When you go to the link that was on that previous slide, and just as a reminder, um, we will make sure we get you the links that were in the slide presentation, as well as the link to the recording when we're finished with the webinar today. But when you do go to that link from the previous slide, you should be able to access a guidance packet on HIV. There is a section in there about cyberbullying that lists what you should do and not do if your child is being cyberbullied. Some of the suggestions include the following. First, become familiar with the current technology and set clear rules for your child. Second, use protective software that would block some sites you don't want your child to use. Uh, third, do not ban your child from using technology. This is important because if you ban, your child could become angry and rebel. When that happens, your child could hide their online activities. I've seen this happen many times myself. I know of a mother who shut off the Wi-Fi network at home as a form of punishment. So what did her son do? He simply locked his bedroom door and connected to the next door neighbor's Wi-Fi network. 
Uh, fourth, encourage your child not to reply to cyberbullying because bullies love a strong reaction from those that they pick on. Fifth, save all the evidence of cyberbullying that you could use as evidence for the HIV investigation. Uh, it's significant for you to be aware of all this, given that bullying can have a negative impact on a child's ability to receive an education. Disability Rights New Jersey has had cases over the years where students with disabilities were afraid to go back to school because of bullying. Uh, I hope your child does not have to go through that. Okay, now we're getting into the gist of the webinar. I am sure all of you know Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the IDEA for short, uh, requires a school district to provide a free appropriate public education to students with disabilities between the ages of three through 21. There is no question many students with disabilities have had their educational services disrupted by the COVID pandemic and they need makeup services as a result. There was a lot of concern about school districts wanting to graduate students who turned 21 during the past school year, this past June, even though they might not have gotten appropriate services due to the pandemic. More specifically, their concern was that because they turned 21, they would not be able to invoke stay put to stop the graduation from happening and to continue their educational services until the dispute is resolved in mediation or due process. New Jersey Governor Murphy finally signed into law what most of us know as S3434 on June 16, 2021, that addresses that particular concern relating to the students who turned 21 this past school year. S3434, now officially New Jersey Statute 18A, colon 46-6.3, added another year of eligibility for special education students for students who turn 21 during this past school year or will turn 21 during the next two school years. You need to understand that S3434 only extends special education eligibility. It does not mean a guarantee of one more year of special education services. A school district can still decide that the student is still ready to graduate even if the student has another year of eligibility. If the student does not want to graduate at the end of the school year during when the student turned 21, then the student can file for mediation or due process to get stay put to stop the graduation. Disability Rights New Jersey has on its website a fact sheet with more detailed information about S3434 that you can look up. The link for the fact sheet is on the slide. There have also been some concerns about students who turned 21 during the 2019-20 school year or graduated at the end of the 2019-20 school year. A lot of those students had their educational services disrupted by the COVID pandemic when the pandemic forced the schools to close in March 2020. Are those particular students covered under S3434? The answer is no. Can those students still try to receive makeup services if they did not get an appropriate education between March and June of 2020? The good news is they can. They may not have any right to stay put under S3434, but they can still pursue compensatory education. Generally speaking, a student has up to two years to seek compensatory, compensatory education to make up for the loss of appropriate IEP-related special education services, like academic instruction and related services, such as speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, or what have you. The student could also seek compensatory transitional services that would include job sampling, community experiences, and development of daily living skills. Daily living skills would be like balancing a checkbook, learning how to take public transportation, folding clothes, and so forth. How can the student seek the compensatory education? The student should first write a letter to the school district's special education department, A, to inform 
that the student requires additional or compensatory services, and B, to request an IEP meeting to discuss the student's needs. The letter should be sent either by way of fax or certified mail, so the student can confirm the district received it. The district must, must respond and schedule a meeting within 20 calendar days from the date it receives that letter. What should the student bring to the IEP meeting to show the need for compensatory education? There is no uniform answer to that question because every student's situation is unique. The student should be prepared to outline the reasons why the school district must provide compensatory education and what services are needed. The student should list all of the academic services, related services, or transition services that the student was entitled to receive under the 2019-20 IEP and the dates that these services were either not provided the right way or not provided at all. If the student has any additional documents, such as an evaluation report, to support the need for compensatory education, then the student should also bring those documents to the IEP meeting. If the school district either refuses to have an IEP meeting to discuss compensatory education or declines compensatory education during the IEP meeting, the student could file for mediation or due process. Disability Rights New Jersey has on its website a frequently asked questions packet for seeking compensatory education for students who graduated at the end of the 2019-20 school year. The packet includes a sample letter requesting an IEP meeting to address compensatory education. It also includes guidance as to how to file for mediation or due process if there is a disagreement over compensatory education. And you can access that packet at the link that you see on the slide. Okay, so now we'll really focus on a very important right students have, and that is the right to stay put. Stay put is essentially the prevention of the change the school district wants to implement to the student's educational program and placement until the dispute is resolved in litigation. For example, the school district thinks a student should attend a different school, so it proposes a new IEP stating the student should go to the different school. The parent does not agree because the parent has been happy with the student's current school all along, so the parent files for mediation or due process to prevent the proposed IEP from going into effect. That sounds pretty simple, right? Unfortunately, it's not always so simple. I have always believed if there is a way for the special education gods to make the special education process more complicated to understand, then they will. The New Jersey Department of Education produced a special education packet called the Parental Rights in Special Education Packets more commonly known as the PRISE, P-R-I-S-E, to help students and parents understand their special education rights. Unfortunately, PRISE does not cover everything a student or parent should know, especially about stay put. I will point out what you need to know regarding stay put that the PRISE does not explain. First of all, many students and parents think that when a school district proposes a new IEP, that they have to either accept or challenge all of it, which is not necessarily true. The student or parent has the right to invoke stay put to prevent the implementation of a certain part or parts of the proposed IEP. The federal regulation that allows for doing that is 34 CFR section 300.300D3. Here's an example to help you understand the significance of the right to challenge a part or parts of a proposed IEP. Let's say this particular student with a severe disability has always had extended school year or ESY. And they've had that service every summer. The parents in the school district have an IEP meeting at the end of the school year. The IEP team agrees the student needs ESY services again that summer. However, the district thinks the student should go to a different school in the fall, which the parent does not agree with. The parent gets the proposed IEP from the district after the meeting. When the parent files a mediation or due process request to invoke stay put, 
to prevent the student's attendance to the different school in the fall, they can cite this specific federal regulation, 34 CFR 300.300 D3, in the mediation or due process request to clarify that the parent has no problem with the ESY part of the proposed IEP. This isn't a sentence that I actually wrote when I filed for due process on behalf of a client a few years ago to give you an idea of what you could write in the mediation or due process request. Accordingly, petitioners are filing this due process petition to invoke stay put, except for the ESY portion of the new IEP, which is allowable under 34 CFR 300.300 D3. Okay, so now on to the next thing you need to know. Next thing you need to know pertains to the office, uh, to the official notice requirement. For many years in New Jersey, if a school district wants to implement a change of program or placement, the district must provide you with official 15 day notice. Graduation is considered a change of placement for the purpose of the 15 day notice also. If you do not file for mediation or due process within 15 days, then the school district can implement the change. The US Department of Education did a review of the New Jersey special education regulations and found the 15 day note notice requirement invalid because it conflicts with the federal IDEA, IDEA regulations. As a result, the New Jersey Department of Education issues a memorandum dated August 6, 2019, stating that a student can still obtain stay put even after the mediation or due process request was filed after 15 days of receiving notice. The link to that memo dated August 6, 2019 is on the slide. In addition to issuing the August 6, 2019 memo, the New Jersey Department of Education revised the prize by removing the 15 day notice requirement language. The revised prize was also issued to the public in 2019 and the link for that revised prize is on the slide as well. However, the 15 day notice requirement is still not completely dead. The New Jersey Department of Education issued new special education regulations last year that still kept the 15 day notice language even after the release of the August 2019 memo and the new version of the prize. The 15 day language can be found at NJAC 6A 14-2.3H. The Office of Administrative Law, which hears special education disputes, addressed an emergent relief hearing in the case SV on behalf of MG versus Butler Borough School District, docket number EDS 06614-21. That was decided on August 10th, 2021. In that case, the parent in the school district had an IEP meeting on March 21st, 2021. The school district proposed an IEP that called for the student to attend a different school. The parent didn't want her child to attend. The parent did not file for due process to challenge the proposed IEP until 74 days later on August 3rd, 2021. The Office of Administrative Law ruled the parent did not have the right to stay put because the proposed IEP went into effect after 15 days. You should be able to see the conflict here. On one hand, you have this August 2019 memo stating the 15 day notice requirement is invalid and the 2019 version of the prize with the 15 day notice requirement language removed. But on the other hand, you have the current special education regulations and the Butler case that both state the 15 day requirement is still in effect. So what should you do? My thinking is that you should always try to play it safe by filing for mediation or due process within 15 days. If for whatever reason, the 15 days have already passed, you should attach a copy of the August 2019 memo to your mediation or due process request to remind the judge the 15 day requirement should be disregarded. You should also make sure to file for mediation or due process before the date 
the change of placement happens. For example, if the proposed IEP calls for a different place on September 3rd, you should make sure to file for mediation or due process before September 3rd. If the district wants to graduate your child on June 30th, you should make sure to file before June 30th. So you get the drift there. Because the 15 day rule seems to be alive still, you should make sure the proposed IEP you receive is the draft version or the final version. Parents with good reason have gotten confused over when the 15 day clock starts when they get the draft IEP or final version of the IEP. It makes more sense for the 15 day clock to start when the parent receives the final version. Otherwise the parent would have to file for mediation or due process for each draft of the IEP he or she does not want implemented. It would be ridiculous for a parent to have to file for mediation or due process five times if the proposed IEP was modified five times. There was a case decided by the Office of Administrative Law back in 2007 called ML on behalf of RH versus the Beverly City School District. The citation is on the slide um, where this issue came up. The school district provided a proposed draft IEP, not the final version of the proposed IEP. The administrative law judge ruled that the 15 days is not triggered until the district provides the final draft of the proposed IEP. Having stated this, my suggestion for you is to make sure a proposed IEP is labeled as either a draft or the final version. When you go to an IEP meeting to review and create a new IEP, mark the IEP during the meetings as a draft. Even better, Write something more specific like, this IEP is a draft. The district agrees to provide mother, father, or student the final version of the IEP after this meeting for review and consideration. Make sure to ask the school district for a copy of the final version of the proposed IEP after the IEP meeting. Your request to the district should always be in writing, like email, so you have a paper trail. Without a paper trail, you could end up in a dispute over who said what, and that's the last thing you would want. Now we will get to the part that makes me dislike the prize. The prize has a section on emergent relief and an explanation of what it is and how to file it. However, to be honest, its explanation is so inadequate when it, stays to, when it comes to stay put. When you file an application for emergent relief, you must make sure there is an underlying due process petition. If there is already a due process petition pending, you can file an emergent relief application. If there is no due process petition pending, then you must file an emergent relief application and a due process petition at the same time, so there is an underlying due process petition. You must file a certification or an affidavit, usually your own, confirming relevant facts attached to the emergent relief application. The emergent relief, uh, the emergent relief hearing takes place relatively quickly after the application is filed, between one to 10 days, depending on the issue. The New Jersey special education regulations state that a party can only file for emergent relief under four narrow circumstances. Issues involving a break in the delivery of services, issues involving disciplinary action, issues concerning placement while the due process proceeding is ongoing, or issues involving graduation or participation in a graduation ceremony. If the issue does not fall within one of the issues listed, then the administrative law judge will reject the application without hearing it. For stay put purposes, you should mark C. If the issue is to prevent graduation for take, from taking place, which is a stay put matter also, you should mark D. The prize states that to obtain emergent relief, you have to satisfy all four prongs, which are uh, paraphrased here. The student will suffer irreparable harm if the emergent relief is not granted the legal right 
underlying the student's claim is settled, the student has a good chance of prevailing on the merits of the underlying due process claim, and the student will suffer greater harm than the school district would if the student loses the application for emergent relief. In many cases, it's true that you would have to satisfy all four prongs to obtain emergent relief. However, what the prize does not tell you is if you are filing for emergent relief to get stay put, you do not have to satisfy those four prongs. Well, why don't you need to satisfy all four prongs for stay put? It's because courts have clarified that stay put functions like an automatic injunction or stop until the pending litigation is finally over. So what exactly do you actually do to obtain stay put? Basically, you have to show what the IEP in effect was at the time you filed for stay put. What the IEP calls for in terms of program and placement should be in the stay put. Attach a copy of the IEP to the affidavit, affidavit or certification to go with the emergent relief application. If you're trying to stop the graduation from happening, you would do the same thing, attach a copy of the IEP in effect to your emergent relief application. You would also need to provide evidence of the school district's intention to graduate, like an official graduation notice, and you would attach a copy of those documents to the affidavit or certification to go with the emergent release relief application as well. Again, you do not need to satisfy the four prongs for stay put. You just would need to show what the IEP in effect was at the time you filed for mediation or due process. So as we um, move forward, I think that's enough for now and we have some time. And so uh, we can answer some questions. If you have some, feel free to put them in the chat um, and we can answer them for you. As you're writing your questions, I'm going to put us to the slide that has our contact information so you have it. There's our phone, our email address, our social media, our website address, which has all of these links that were on the slides that you just saw. There's our website address in the chat. Christina, thank you for the question, and we'll get we'll get Robert to come on video uh, and answer that for us. Robert, the question in the chat is, if the person is graduated as of last June, can you still file for stay put emergent relief technically since the school year has already started? Oh, give us one second, Christina. I realize Robert lost his connection and here he comes. He's coming back in now. Sorry about that. <laughs> Anyone else, as we're waiting for Robert to settle back in, if you have any questions, please feel free. Drop them in the chat box. Robert, we have a question from Christina. And the question is, if the person has graduated as of last June, can you still file for stay put or emergent relief technically? since the school year has already started. Robert says he's having problems with his camera. Wait, I'm gonna put, Christina, I'm gonna put your question back in the chat so Robert can see it. Yes, Jessica, thank you for your comment in the chat, Jessica. We will, we'll email the, 
link to the PowerPoint and the link to the recording once it gets posted up on the website. So you'll have all those resources. Thanks for pointing that out, appreciate it. Robert, I put, I put Christina's question back in the chat for you. Oh, Robert says in the chat, no, you can't get stay put if the school year has already started because that student has already graduated. Thanks, Robert. Any other questions? The chat? I just wanted to put this other slide back up as well. Uh, these uh, webinars that we are doing are um, presented in, in coordination with the New Jersey Council on Development on Disabilities, and there is all their contact information on the screen as well. So you have theirs. One final call for questions. Okay, I don't see any other questions coming in. So I, I will say to you, thank you for your time today. And as I mentioned before, we will make sure that we send you the link to the recording as well as the link to the slide. So you'll have access to all of those great resources that Robert shared. Great, everyone, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day and we hope to see you at a future webinar. Thanks very much, take care.